So yeah, I mean, if you gotta redo a level, like we had, what, we had to do Enchanted Earth uh, Friday night, what, like two or three times? Because, like, I either didn't have enough health, I sucked at the platforming because the camera was being uncooperative, but, I mean, we wound up, like, yeah, I had to play Enchanted Earth two or three times, but by the time I finished that level... It was like, I knew that level like the back of my hand, because, like, the levels are only but so big. I, I think it's a good remake. It's not the best remake I've seen. I've, I've definitely seen better remakes. Like, I feel like the title of best, best remake right now is going to go down in history as Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2 is the best remake I have ever seen. Uh, it is the best remake I have ever played. Now, that could change in March <laughs> when Final Fantasy VII releases. And I really, oh, I really hope that isn't the case. I really hope that isn't the case. For as long as I've been waiting for the Final Fantasy VII remake, if that thing winds up sucking, it's going to be a bad time for everybody. It's going to be a bad time for everybody. Like, Square Enix will die if the Final Fantasy VII Remake sucks. Like, I will tell you that right now. Every Final Fantasy VII fan in existence, which there is a lot of us, if that remake winds up sucking, Square Enix is dead in the water. No one's going to be happy if it's not good. No, there will be people that will be happy if it's not good, and it will be the people that don't like Final Fantasy VII. Which, I mean, if you don't like it, fine, you don't like it, but don't ruin it for us. We've been waiting too many years. We have been waiting so fucking long for the remake. Final Fantasy VII Remake turns out to be Hallway Simulator 2.0. Dude, like, I will cry on stream, like, gigantic, ugly girl tears if that game winds up sucking. Like, I will be beside myself. Something will be broken on stream if that game sucks. Hey, Dragon, you made an intro for your Twitch? Cool. Uh, I hope your viewers like it, man. But, uh, yeah. Medieval is officially a wrap, and I'm I'm satisfied. I'm I'm very very satisfied. The game was only thirty bucks. Game was only thirty bucks. I definitely felt like I got my money's worth out of it. It was fun. Controls were a little frustrating sometimes. Camera was a little frustrating sometimes. But overall, I had a fun experience. Like controls and camera were a little frustrating, but one thing that the game does and it does very very well is as you progress through the game, if you've been getting the chalices and been getting the upgrades to the weapons and the shields, the game is very, very good at making you feel powerful and well-equipped. Like, at no point did I ever sit there and wonder, do I have enough ammo to take care of this? Never thought that once. I got enough ammo to do it. Um, not once did I sit there and go, do I have enough health to take out this boss? Not once did I think that. I was like, okay, I went into the fight with Zerok. What, three or four health bottles in? Like, most of my health bottles were already gone. I was like, okay, I have three left. I've got enough to beat him. So. You still can't believe that it'll only be Midgard? 15% of Final Fantasy Seven. Midgard is a little bit more than... Midgar is a little more than 15%. Realistically, I would say um, Midgar, like, as a whole. Midgar as a whole is about 25-30% of the game. Because you, you do spend a lot of time in Midgar before you wind up getting to the outer, uh, the open world map. And that's what I think um, what they're going to wind up doing with Final Fantasy VII is 
keep in mind, this is not a remaster. This is a remake. So, some things might change. Some things might be tweaked. And more content may be added to make your stay in Midgar a lot more time consuming. With the entire first chapter of the game being in Midgar, this is going to be a two game, a two disc, $60 game that they are saying is going to have over 100 plus hours of content in it. And we're not leaving Midgar at all. So, in the original game, we visited Sector 6, Sector 5, Sector 3, Sector 7 and then Sector 1, which is the Upper Plate. And then the Highway, and then we left Midgar and headed on to Calm, which opened up the world map. So I am going to guess that your run-in in Sector 5, which is going to be where you meet Eris, where you fall through the roof of the church and land in her flower patch, your jaunt into Sector 5 is going to be a lot more fleshed out. There's going to be more to do. There's probably going to be more side quests. Your jaunt into Sector 1, Shinra Headquarters, is going to be a lot more fleshed out. There's going to be a lot more that you can explore. Uh, the sewer system, the railroad system of Sector 6 and Sector 7 are probably going to be a lot more in-depth. The reactors are probably going to be a lot more in-depth. Um, we're probably going to be able to run around the upper part of Sector 7 and Sector 6. Uh, one, one of the things I always said, like, I hope they kind of do, because they're going to have to open up Midgar a little bit here in order for us to explore, to flesh out the content. Um, they need to make it, if we're staying completely in the city for the first part of the game, they need to flesh out the city as much as humanly possible. And one of the things that I hope that they do you hear about it throughout the entire playthrough of Final Fantasy VII. Uh, you hear about it a ton in Crisis Core, and that is the play known as Loveless. You see it advertised in theaters as you walk throughout the city. Uh, Genesis constantly quotes the play from a little book that he has in Crisis Core. Sid Highwind constantly quotes Loveless in the third act of the game. So it is actually my hope not to see the full complete play, but we see some animated advertisements for Loveless. Maybe we can go into one of the theaters and it's fine if it repeats. I don't I don't care if it repeats, but let us see a snippet of this play that we've spent years in this world hearing about. And I always thought something like that would be so cool to just add in as like little extra content. Man, I don't know, no carnival or place where Barrett's original story takes place. Alright, so here's pretty much the roadmap uh, for Final Fantasy VII Raxel. Also, uh, Vorgad. Final Fantasy VII was a three-disc adventure. They didn't move over to four-disc until Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, Final Fantasy VIII was a four-disc game. Final Fantasy VII was only three. But, Final Fantasy VII Remake... The one that we are getting in March, Raxel, is basically Chapter 1. Uh, the game is going to be episodic. They have said that they are going to make it episodic this time around. Now, while I do understand that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, because originally, we got the entire game, three discs, $60. And we had the full Final Fantasy VII experience. I understand people being upset over that, but if they are going to make this an episodic thing and we're going to see three games out of this franchise remake, then wouldn't you think that because they are splitting up the story, that they are going to add more content within it to make sure you get your money's worth? Like, I'm pretty sure... Um... Nomura is not stupid. Like, he's not stupid. Like, he's gonna give us our money's worth. Fourth disc was a demo. Yeah, because uh, Square, Square, Soft, Square Soft used to love to throw demo discs in their game. How do you put uh, your intro? 
on your Twitch stream. Uh, you just load it as a video file onto your streaming program, dude. Like, I have all my stuff hot keyed up to a button, so all I gotta do is hit one, and you get my intro. Like, you, you gotta fiddle around with your settings. Episodic makes me nervous only because I think back to Half-Life. Square Enix is not Valve. Valve has shown time and time again they do not know how to count past two. Don't think that Square Enix is going to make the same mistake. Like, trust me, they know how to count past two. We've had three Final Fantasy XIII games. They know how to count past two. <laughs> I would not stress that. I wouldn't stress that at all. You ultimately trust Squeenix will complete this? Absolutely. They they know their ass is on the line if Final Fantasy VII tanks. Like, they know they are fucked if this does not go over well. And that's why, like, yes, it has been frustrating that we have been waiting, what, over five years now? We've been waiting over five years. Either over five or almost five. One of the two. It, it has been multiple years since they announced that this was happening. And yeah, we had went for so long, hadn't heard shit. Um, another year came and went, two or three E3s went by. Not a fucking word. And then they started talking about it this year. And I was like, wow, this looks really, really good. The gameplay looks really, really good. The dialogue sounds good. The animations look good. If this is what I've been waiting on, then it's worth the wait. And I've said this time and time again. Yes, waiting for a game is frustrating. It's insanely frustrating. But would you rather them take their time? and delay a game, and by the time you get it, it's one of the best things you've ever played. Or, you want them to f run that game out as quickly as humanly possible, so you don't have to wait. And the next thing you know, you're playing Anthem again. I would have happily waited two more years for Anthem and have that game be something that I am playing today as much as I play Destiny, as much as I play Mortal Kombat. Anthem will forever go down in history as that game that broke my heart. I was so ready for Anthem and it just wound up being the world's biggest disappointment. Like, I legit cried over Anthem. Here's the thing, here's the thing. Here's how you know Anthem could have been something great. You all know him, you all love him, Papa Prime. Papa Prime, he's never been a gamer. He's had a couple games that he's played. Like, he played the shit out of MechWarrior 2. He played the shit out of Virtual Lawn. Uh, while he was playing games with me. Uh, he, he loved playing John Madden football in the Sega Genesis. He loved playing Cyberball, which was a all-robot football game on the Sega Genesis. He loved playing all that stuff. But ever since then, hadn't uttered a word about ever picking up a video game ever again. Anthem. And Anthem alone had him this close to going out and buying a PlayStation 4, buying an Xbox One, just so he could play it. And I'll tell you this right now, if he had actually followed through on it, I'd have been playing Anthem on console. Just so I could play games with my dad. And then he watched me play it on stream... He watched me play it a few times. He watched me beat the story. And I'll never forget it. I will never fucking forget it. Me and him said the exact same thing when I finished the story. 
So that's it. And hadn't touched it since. Anthem could have been one of the greatest action MMORPGs we had ever laid our eyes on. And it was destroyed. It was dead on arrival. All because of EA Games. And the sad thing is, because of EA Games' practices and how they handle business, this could spell doom for what was one of the greatest video game companies out there, Bioware. The death of Anthem is going to ultimately lead to the death of Mass Effect and the death of Dragon Age. Now, Dragon Age doesn't bother me very much, but everybody on, in this chat knows how much I am absolutely in love with the Mass Effect universe. And knowing that I could potentially never see another Mass Effect ever again, that makes me very upset. They should have pushed it back a year to really polish it out. See, that's my thing. That's my thing. I'd have happily waited another two years. Honestly, what would help Bioware out right now quite a bit would be a remaster of 1, 2, and 3. I agree. Put the Mass Effect trilogy on modern day consoles. And then not only remaster them for modern day consoles, make them half price. Put the entire trilogy out for $60. Yep, DLC and everything. Put it all together. $60, all three games, DLC for all three of them. If you're on PC, then you get controller support for the first game. Absolutely. Bundle package, remastered in 4K. $60. The entire Mass Effect trilogy. The whole goddamn thing. That shit would sell like hotcakes. And don't get me wrong, I liked Mass Effect Andromeda. Mass Effect Andromeda had a good thing going for it. It just needed more time to cook in the oven. Once they ironed out all the issues, Andromeda is a great game. You take the time to mod and do some texture tweaks to Mass Effect Andromeda, it's one of the best looking games you've ever seen in your life. We've been begging for a remaster for years, and it would have taken half the time building up a game from scratch, and would sell really well, and bring in those who have never played the old Mass Effect games. Exactly. Everybody, everybody would be chomping at the bits to cruise the galaxy with Commander Shepard. Absolutely. But, that's not how EA does business. And because of how EA does business, next two years we could see the end of Bioware. And that is going to destroy me. <clears throat> and I mean, like... You, you could take something like this. Something like this. This was not a super well-known franchise. But this is a good remake. Flaws and all, this is a good remake. And it sold pretty well. Because there are people out there like me that like, Dude, I loved having my adventures with Sir Dan. And I'm ready to do it again. Not gonna lie, you kind of have a personal hate boner for EA. I feel like they were the leading example of scummy monetary practices in the industry. Oh, you're not the only one that feels that way. I feel they've had a bankruptcy coming to them that said they have some great IPs but hope they get bought out once they go under. A lot of my favorite games back in the day came from EA. And that's that's a very sad thing. Because to this day, and I'll never fucking forgive them for doing it. I'll never fucking forgive them. Because 
the series didn't deserve it. Dead Space. Who remembers Dead Space? Dead Space sold very, very well. Dead Space 2 sold even fucking better. Dead Space 3 rolls around. We need your game to play more like Resident Evil 4. Can't just be a survival horror game. Nope. Gotta be an action run and gun game. And Dead Space 3 didn't sell well because of it. Even though it's actually a very good story. Dead Space 3 is an absolutely fantastic story. And if you played the DLC, which takes place after the ending of the game, you come to find out, story ain't over yet. But, because it didn't hit the projected sales that EA Games wanted, Visceral Games got shut down. We will never see another Dead Space. There was even talks, like, Matt McMuscles, uh, the guy who used to be a part of Super Best Friends, he has a series on YouTube called What Happened, and his latest video is about Dead Space. And, like, there was animes about Dead Space. There was minigames for Dead Space. There was comics. There was even talk of a movie for Dead Space. But because Dead Space 3 didn't do well, <sighs> down the toilet it fucking went yeah exa exactly like they they show no love to indie titles whatsoever they d they they look at it like it's fucking pocket change like oh look here's here's five pennies that just so happens to be an indie game title and they just throw it out there the only indie title they have ever shown any love to whatsoever was unravel Seeing how loot boxes are now high frowned upon and EA doesn't care because it's all about money to them. Uh, it's, it's not just about that. Yeah, there's there's that too. There's a lot of EA games that's owned by John. EA fucking murdered a franchise that used to be the pioneer of tycoon games, Sim City. Yeah. And who remembers the greatest wrestling game of all time? I don't care what anyone says. You can say it's WCW versus NWO Revenge if you want to. You can say it's WWF No Mercy if you want to. But we all know the fucking truth. The greatest fucking wrestling game of all time was Def Jam Fight for New York. Published by EA Games. That shit didn't last long, did it? <laughs> the only solid game that comes out of EA to this day is The Sims, and even it feels like beating a dead horse. Yeah. Like, I was going to say Star Wars Battlefront, but, like, Battlefront is handled by DICE. It is published and distributed by EA. EA doesn't actually own that shit. Which, which is why... Which is why I do have relatively high hopes for Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Because that's being done by Respawn. EA isn't touching it other than to publish it. So, that's being done by Respawn, and that's being done by the guys that did Titanfall. And the Titanfall guys doing the Star Wars game, I'm in. <laughs> a Way Out uh, somehow survived their awful fucking meddling. Yeah, and A Way Out was actually really good. Uh, clowns. Respawn won't do that. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. Respawn will not do that for one reason and one reason only. Money. Bungie is the perfect example for this. Bungie, they are having a little bit of growing pains ever since they pulled away from Activision. Now, the content for um, Destiny has been absolutely fantastic, but they are reusing content. Like, we've been to the moon before. And we went back. Now there are some changes to the moon. But for the most part, it's still the moon. And that is because now Bungie is having to pay for everything themselves. They don't have Activision's money anymore. And that's the price they pay in order to make their own decisions for the game. 
Now, the decisions they have been making for the game are ultimately good ones. I mean, there's, there's always going to be things that need to be fixed. Individual problems with items and weapons and Titans going crazy with one-eyed mask. And every Tom, Dick, and Harry, including myself, going into Crucible with the fucking recluse. <laughs> Like, these are things that just have to be handled over time, but the overall direction of the game is now solely handled by them. Activision no longer has a say, but the trade-off is, is they now have to fund everything themselves. And with the game now going free-to-play, uh, which I think is an incredibly smart move on their part, everything is now a la carte, you pay for what you want. <coughs> But stuff like the Eververse is going to be more prominent than ever now. They are going to limit how much you can buy with in-game currency to encourage you to pay cold hard cash for silver to buy these items. Because they now need the Eververse in order to help fund the game. And one of the best examples I can give is that premium skin for R Whisper of the Worm, the sniper rifle that you get from that quest. The sales of the premium skin for the Whisper of the Worm single-handedly funded the zero-hour mission, which allowed us to get Outbreak perfected. So this, these are the kind of things that you need to consider going on, like, going forward. That, like, things like this are now necessary for Bungie to do in order to keep the game up and running. Money is, honest to God, the only reason EA still has a presence in the industry. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely, they are. They are one of the most... They are one of the wealthiest game companies. And that's because they've been around forever. And they have the proper funding. Honestly glad American McGee isn't working for EA for the final Alice game. He's fully on Patreon funding with a few private investors. Nice. But take a company like Arxis. Air games do well, but that isn't why they're in the conversation they talked about. Because they put passion into their work and are constantly innovating. Yet they can't come up with a fucking rollback netcode. Figure it out. Some of the best looking games, some of the best functioning games known to mankind, absolutely abysmal online. Figure it out. But yeah, case in point, uh, I'm really hoping just to try and come full circle here. I, I really hope that Final Fantasy VII does well. I, I hope Destiny continues to do well. Because I have never been more into Destiny than I have been lately. Like, Shadowkeep brought me back full force. 